Okay, great. I think about everyone is here. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us on our advanced load rating webinar. Uh, this webinar will be presented by Daniel Baxter, who is one of the elite engineers um, from Michael Baker. Uh, he's worked on various projects such as the Fulton Road Bridge, the Inner Belt Bridge Rehab, Rehab and the I-225 Rail Bridge. So today he'll be going over the, our topic into more depth, the advanced load rating methods for various bridge types and we will be offering a free PDH, one uh, per person for this course. Oh, well, thank you for the introduction, Grace. Uh, can you hear me just fine? Yes. Great. Okay, great. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, well, with the uh, increasing demand nationwide for load rating services, uh, today I'd like to share uh, just a general method of load rating that Baker has been successfully applying to rate bridges of just about Every bridge type, I'll, uh, I'll start today by going over the just general load rating procedure that we've been following for uh, complex and not so complex structures. Then as an example of applying this procedure to uh, one particular more complex type of structure, I'll talk about how to apply it for rating a, a curved reinforced concrete slab. And then for the last part of the talk, I'll go into uh, a bit of detail about a rating of steel curved girders, which uh, in my mind are some of the more complex structures out there when it comes to performing a load rating. Well, here's the uh, general load rating procedure that we've been following and I'm going to talk about today. It's five basic steps. The first is just to create a model, the bridge that you're load rating using finite element analysis software and calculate permanent loads to apply to the model, which will then output force effects. Second part of the procedure is to then find demand capacity ratios over the length of the structure by uh, applying an HL93 loading to the model and representative permit vehicles for the agency whose structure you're rating. Third step is to look at the results from uh, the demand capacity ratios over the length of the structure to then select uh, so-called points of interest. These are the points of the structure that have uh, for the, the suite of vehicles that you're considering the highest demand capacity ratios and thus are uh, going to control your rating. For the, and then the fourth step is for these points of interest to then to extract influence lines for the force effect in question at each point of interest. And, one, and then the fifth step, once you have these influence lines, you can then run any standard or user specified vehicle you want over the structure and then determine rating factors through the use of the influence lines and the information you've already gathered in the previous steps. So let's see how, these, uh, how this process plays out for uh, one example bridge type here, which isn't too complex. It's a type of uh, concrete rigid frame uh, found in the state of Oklahoma. These were typically constructed in the 1950s and early 60s uh, as part of the uh, early interstates that were being constructed. They, uh, these uh, concrete rigid frames, ones shown here, have a uh, solid slab superstructure and solid wall piers, roller supports at the abutment, and internal hinges at the pier bases. And the uh, wall piers have a fixed rigid connection to the superstructure. So uh, Baker has been rating a number of these structures. And I'll just show how this uh, general procedure works with regards to, to rating one of these con uh, concrete rigid frames. The, uh, the first is to build a uh, structural model. We've been successfully using MIDAS software for this task, as well as uh, many, many other projects for many years. And we really do like the software, uh, although this is not don't, don't want to plug Midas too hard, but uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me to give the webinar anyhow. And uh, so we start by building a uh, model of the structure, 2D in this case, just a foot width strip of the bridge. And we uh, calculate distribution factors for this model using uh, SD ash to equivalent width met met method for uh, concrete slab bridges, and then build the model using the information given on the original design plans. We uh, load this model with uh, permanent loads that are applied to a foot width strip, as well as, uh, as well as HL93 live load and two representative ODOT permit vehicles whose distribution factors are calculated using the ASHTO equivalent width method. Then uh, when, once we've placed these loadings in the model, we'll run our foot width strip model, and are, able, and are then able to extract uh, inventory level uh, forces from this model, which then we put into a code check spreadsheet. 
and th this code check spreadsheet has input from it both the uh, output forces from the model and all of the uh, section properties for the actual bridge and the, the rebar properties and can then use the uh, use the cross sections of the model the force effects from the uh, the model of uh, cross sections of the bridge the force effects from the model to then apply the appropriate flexure shear combined axial force and flexure ashto lrf decode equations and then compute demand capacity ratios spreadsheet will sort these demand capacity ratios for each uh, element of the structure which will then allow us to determine uh, the demand capacity ratios all along the bridge and what our uh, controlling points of interest are. One slight wrinkle for uh, these concrete rigid frame structures is that the, uh, the legs are in combined axial compression and bending. So for, for these uh, um, aspect proportions of, re of these reinforced concrete rigid frames, our code check spreadsheet make, makes interaction diagrams. And it's easy enough to pick out demand capacity ratios using an interaction diagram. Uh, all you need to do is just to plot the actual uh, moment and axial force uh, demand on the interaction diagram, pass a line through that point that goes to the origin through this point, and where that line intersects the action di uh, interaction diagram, that's your uh, moment and axial force capacity, so you can then, uh, at capacity for loads of the same eccentricity as the actual applied load, which will then allow you to determine demand capacity ratio. So once, uh, once we have all our results in our code check spreadsheet, we can look along the length of the bridge and see what our controlling points of interest are. These, again, are the points along the structure which are going to control the load rating. And they have the largest demand capacity ratios. So for these concrete rigid frame structures, typically we've seen uh, that the slab at the face of the pier is a point of interest, often uh, mid-span of the slab, particularly the end spans for positive moment, uh, points of inflection for positive or negative moment where a uh, positive or negative moment longitudinal reinforcement cuts off and the top of the frame legs which see a significant amount of flexure combined with compressive axial force. So once we have selected these points of interest, we need to extract influence lines for them. So here's the uh, influence line for a uh, moment face of the pier, and the, this is uh, extracted, you can use minus to extract influence lines real easily, and the uh, cross, the target crosshair symbol just at the uh, top of the left pier indicates the point on the structure for which the influence line has been extracted, This have to, and the force effect we're showing here is moment, and here you can see uh, the HL93 uh, truck plus lane load placed on this influence line to create maximum negative moment at this location. The, Portions of the influence line below the superstructure are negative moment. Portions above are positive moment. So here, uh, for our points on the uh, top of the pier columns that are subject to a combined axial force and flexure, for these points of interest, we need to extract two influence lines and then uh, determine concurrent live loading. Uh, that's what is uh, shown here. The influence lines for at the top photo are uh, axial force at the top of the pier, indicated at the top of the left pier there with the uh, crosshair mark, while uh, the figure below shows the influence line for flexure at the top of the left pier. So to determine our governing live load, we would run whichever vehicles are being rated over these influence lines and compute concurrent force effects to determine our controlling rating. And then this brings us, uh, once we've extracted influence lines and run vehicles over them, to our final step to determine rating factors. This uh, procedure is applicable to LFR or LRFR rating. Uh, we've uh, been prim primarily doing LRFR ratings. And once this procedure is followed, you have all the information you need to apply the L LRFR rating equation and compute rating factors. We have capacity that's been calculated at each point of interest by using our code check spreadsheet, calculates it for every uh, point along the bridge. So for our points of interest, we can just pull out what the code check spreadsheet is saying for our force effect in question. Uh, permanent uh, force effects have been calculated using the finite element software at each point of interest based on our applied loads that we've calculated. And lastly, our live load in the denominator is determined by running the vehicles that we're rating over the influence lines that we've extracted for each point of interest. And any vehicle can be input. 
And we don't have uh, time, unfortunately, in this webinar to go over the specifics of the different rating of, of, of the different load factors for LRFR ratings, but they, they can be found, of course, in the manual for bridge evaluation, which would then be applied to the equation shown here. So this, uh, this procedure, as I mentioned, is applicable to any structure type, so it lends itself to more complex structures for which there may not be readily available out-of-the-box software packages to perform a rating. And um, one nice thing about it, too, is the user can define and load rate any vehicle of a standard width, so any type of permit vehicle or any type of special permit vehicle can be used. And it also, by, by virtue of using influence lines, has the, ver has the ability that this information, as we're doing in the state of Oklahoma, can be incorporated into a statewide automated permit approval system, which lets uh, truckers and freight carriers just enter the uh, permit vehicle that they're seeking to be approved, which will then can automatically be checked for the route the vehicle uh, the shipping company would like to take. Now, uh, for more basic ratings where uh, the, this type of automation is not desired, standard vehicle load rates can just be determined by following just the first and second steps of this procedure, where then you have your uh, code check spreadsheet just export a rating. Drawback of that method, though, is you can't, uh, when, once you, if you only go through those first two steps, you can't then rate any vehicle you would like in the future without going back and doing those steps again. So in terms of which uh, uh, steel bridge types we've rated, on, and we've got uh, deck trusses, through trusses, delta frame bridges, curved and skewed steel girders that I will uh, talk about more in this presentation, and tied arch bridges. It's a very versatile procedure. Model all of these structures with Midas Civil quite successfully. In terms of uh, concrete bridges that we've rated, uh, this procedure works just as well for concrete done uh, reinforced concrete uh, curved slabs. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Post-tension segmental box girders, which unfortunately we don't have time in this uh, presentation to go into. That's a pretty interesting topic. Uh, concrete rigid frames, as we've seen for this example, and a uh, open spandrel post-tensioned arch, so it'd be a Fulton Road Bridge in Cleveland, along with earth-filled reinforced concrete arches. So it's a very versatile procedure. Let's take a look in some detail about how you might, how you, one would extend this procedure to probably the next level of complexity beyond a straight concrete rigid frame bridges, bridge. Uh, this is a uh, curved uh, concrete rigid frame uh, reinforced concrete hollow slab bridge in the state of Oklahoma. It's in Tulsa. Here uh, we analyze this bridge uh, as longitudinal strips between the pier diaphragms following the method that these bridges were or, were originally designed following in the 1970s. We talked to some of the engineers who had originally designed these bridges. And so they were designed as a system of just straight strips between the piers where then pier diaphragms transfer torsion and shear into the piers. So it's the pier diaphragm that's responsible for taking the torsion and shear forces primarily and transferring them. So here again is a, another look at, the, uh, uh, look at the bridge in question. It's uh, bridge 18118, Oklahoma. It's a six-span, sharply curved, voided reinforced concrete slab. The piers are rigidly fixed to the slab, and many of the piers have hinges at their base, so it is a rigid frame, and the spans range between 42 feet to 62 feet. Well, the first step of the process is just to build an analysis model. Since we're using, uh, let me want to take a sip of water. So we're using the uh, longitudinal strip method. It's uh, sufficient to model this type of bridge as just a single line of beam elements that are integral with the piers. One thing to note, though, when building this model is it's important to make sure the element local axes of your pier are at each pier location aligned with the element local axes of the beam elements used for the superstructure. If you happen to be using MIDAS, you can just turn on your element local axes display function to check that these local axes are aligned. And then you can realign the element local axes of the peer, peer elements if necessary to make sure everything aligns. Then uh, to get into the next level of complexity here, uh, one consideration we have for a, a curved rigid frame such as this that we didn't have for straight rigid frames uh, so much is um, Make it, taking a close look at the pier diaphragm torsion transverse bending. Now we can extract what the torsion is uh, in the pier diaphragms from just this model by looking at what the transverse bending is at these fixed piers. 
And this, uh, this figure here shows the live load placed on the superstructure in such a manner as to maximize that transverse bending. You can see this is an influence line for transverse bending at the top of the pier. So, uh, but this, uh, to analyze one of these bridges, may, may be more appropriate to say that step one is to build models because we need some other uh, detailed models too. And these are strut and tie models of the pier diaphragms themselves. And we can load these strut and tie models, I'll go into that in a little bit, um, by uh, looking at the forces at the top of the pier, the axial force and transverse, uh, the axial compression at the top of the pier and the transverse bending to then from just horizontal and force equilibrium to then load the strut and tie model to then determine forces which we can use to analyze the reinforcement in the pier diaphragms as well as the compression struts. So, so we have our, uh, our models. We uh, can then just determine demand capacity ratios using the same, uh, our same concrete code check spreadsheet or any reinforced concrete design spreadsheet and tool combined with the forces from our output from our model for the superstructure. The pure diaphragms, as I mentioned, were evaluated using, a strut, and, using strut and tie models where these strut and tie models were loaded uh, with forces from the superstructure model and then they were uh, checked using the Ashto strut and tie provisions. We, uh, although the, uh, our, code, our particular code check spreadsheet can do uh, square columns with biaxial flexure and axial compression, we uh, chose to use PCA column in this case to analyze the round pure columns and determine demand capacity ratios. So here's just a little figure showing how one might load the strut and tie model uh, where uh, the F sub T forces, these represent unbalanced load that causes uh, torsion in the this superstructure. It's calculated from the maximum transverse bending moment in the fixed pier. And then the uh, F sub V loads, those are, uh, um, those are loads that are then calculated from the maximum axial force in the pier and adjusted so that we make sure we're maintaining vertical force equilibrium. Once these forces are applied to the strut and tie model, again, you can then use the results from the strut and tie model and the Ashto code equations to check these pier diaphragms and then uh, based on the relation between these forces and our maximum MZ and FX forces, you can extract influence lines from the global model factored appropriately to represent forces in the strut and tie model. So once we've done that, we determined that for this particular bridge, the points of interest were uh, the tension reinforcement in the pier cap diaphragms, a uh, positive moment for the slab at mid-span, um, neg uh, negative moment in the slab near the pier, and combined axial compression and flexure at the top of the pier columns themselves. So um, follow still following our procedure, the next step was to extract influence lines. It's pretty straightforward. Here, um, Two influence lines are shown that would be um, both affect the demand capacity ratios of the pier and the pier diaphragms above the particular pier where they're shown. The, the top image shows the top of pier influence line for maximum out of plane bending in the pier and at the top of the pier, while the lower image shows the influence line for maximum compressive axial force at the top of the pier. So this is just showing where uh, where you would place your live load to maximize these force effects. So, so we did that. Again, we had all the information that we needed to go and crunch through our LRFR load rating equation. We found that for this particular bridge, the pier caps can, pier diaphragms control the rating. It's this particular case, the lowest ODOT routine permit rating factor was 0 0.77. But this is just more to show that how this general procedure can be applied for a more, to a more complex and somewhat unique superstructure type. So now let, let, let's spend some time talking in detail about the uh, load rating of steel curved girder bridges. As I mentioned, I really, I really think when, as far as load rating goes, these are some of the more complex structures out there. And a big part of, a, a big aspect that goes into the results that you'll get for load rating these types of structures are how they are modeled. The, choices that are made in modeling these structures can play a fairly large effect and influence the rating based on the force results you get. So following our overall procedure, we'll just go through by talking about modeling these types of bridges. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that. And then once, uh, once we have the model that we want, computing demand capacity ratio, selecting the points of interest, extracting influence lines, and computing rating factors are all relatively straightforward, although there are some you know, special 
quirks, say, that are unique to steel curve girder bridges. But let's talk about modeling. So it's the first step in this, and uh, there are four, oh, broadly, the, I mean, there are other ways to model these bridges, but uh, for our purposes here, there are uh, four types of models that I'll talk about some detail or grillage models, what I'm here calling a detailed grillage model, refined analysis, and then what I'm here calling a, a detailed refined analysis. Well, we know we need to use one of these methods, at least, to model the steel curve girder system in 3D. These are 3D structures. The cross frames, along, are, along with the girders, of course, are all primary structural elements which are working to transfer torsion to the piers from the superstructure. So to accurately model these bridges, we really should model them in 3D using one of these four methods shown. Now let's start by, uh, let's go through talking about what, what we mean by each of these types of models. And, you know, there, there are you know, plenty of software packages out there that will model these uh, bridges, and I prefer to, you know, model them using just a more general purpose program like Midas, but there are other programs out there like MDX, and all these programs, for the most part, are, are capable, let me back up one slide, of generating, you know, pretty cool-looking screenshots. Not that this is necessarily a cool-looking screenshot, but you, you get what I mean. But I, I would encourage everyone to probe pretty closely and for whatever software you're using to figure out just which of these methods is really being used to model the structure. Because depending on which one it is, it can have a large effect on the results. So don't, don't stop whatever you do at just a pretty-looking screenshot. Because underlying that, there can be a lot of different ways that these bridges are modeled. So let's start by talking about just what a basic grillage model is. Typically, each girder line of a curved girder is modeled as a single line of beam elements, and cross frames are modeled as, sing as single beam elements with one element per cross frame, typically, which are then given section properties derived using the cross frame as a whole, which will you know, typically have a top cord, a bottom cord, and diagonals. Now, the deck may be modeled with shell elements. And typically, I'll explain more about this later, these uh, beam elements do not have what's called a warping torsion degree of freedom. And I sections, they, they take torsional uh, forces by developing flange lateral bending stresses. And their ability to do that is character, characterized by a, a, a warping torsion term of stiffness, which is not typically included in the stiffness uh, uh, formulations that are used for beam elements by most programs. I'm, I'm told that Midas will be adding this stiffness uh, formulation in a future release, but for most, for most programs out there, they don't have this warping torsion degree of freedom for beam elements, which means that these flange lateral bending stresses, if you're just using a beam element to model the uh, entire cross-section of a girder in a curved girder bridge, then need to be approximated. Same goes with the uh, skewed bridges where these flange lateral bending stresses develop as well. But anyhow, this takes a look at a, a grillage model, and it has some advantages. Certainly, they're, they're, they're simple to build, relatively simple, still 3D, but nothing too complex, just, just beam elements. And working with the force results is straightforward because moments and shears will be output for the entire girder cross-section along the length of the girder. And in comparison to the other methods of analysis we have, runtime is relatively short for live load. There are some disadvantages, though. It's uh, not usually as accurate. I mean, this is debatable, but it's not usually as accurate as the other modeling methods that we're going to see. And as I mentioned, flange lateral bending stresses must be approximated. There's no warping torsion uh, degree of freedom for the beam elements that are, are typically used in these models. So some sort of approximate method needs to be used to then back calculate what these flange lateral bending stresses are, which then in turn appear in the uh, Section 6 LRFD code equations. And uh, assuming you're using the simple uh, type of grillage model where uh, individual each cross frame is modeled a single beam element, individual cross frame member forces then for the top core, the bottom core, the diagonals of the cross frames, then must be back calculated from the force results you get for just your single idealized beam element per cross frame, which, which, can, which can be tedious. Now the uh, Next level of refinement is what I'm just calling here a detailed grillage model. I don't think it has an official name. We're, uh, we're here, as before, for just a, um, a basic grillage model. Each girder line is modeled as a single line of beam elements. However, in this case, the individual cross frame members are all modeled, and rigid links can be used to join the cross frame members to the girders, where then uh, if 
see here, we, we can see the beam elements and nodes of the girders are placed at the top flange of the girder, but a, uh, an element offset is used so that the uh, true neutral axis of the section is where it really would be for uh, the type of girder in question. So th this adds a little bit of extra complexity and extra detail to the analysis, because now every single cross frame member is being uh, modeled rather than just being idealized with one beam element per cross frame member. And uh, there are some advantages to this. Individual cross frame member forces are output, so there's no need to go back and derive what, they, uh, what the cross frame member forces would be from just a single idealized element. And, and jury's probably still out on this, but it may be more accurate than basic grillage modeling. Does have some advantages, though, disadvantages, though. This modeling method is not usually as accurate as more refined analysis methods, and as with a uh, basic grillage model, our flange lateral bending stresses need to be approximated. We can't directly obtain them from this modeling method. Now, the next level of complexity then would be so called refined analysis model. Now, in a refined analysis model, uh, each individual flange of the girder is modeled with beam elements along with the cross frames, which are shown in red in this figure. And the girder webs are, metal, are modeled, not metal, modeled with a mesh of shell elements, which are shown in orange here. Now, uh, this uh, modeling method, certainly, it, it, re it represents a, a definite increase in complexity over grillage models, because now, uh, as b before with the grillage model, each individual beam line was modeled with a single line of beam elements. And now we're modeling each girder with a combinant with uh, separate elements for the top flange, the bottom flange, and a mesh of shell elements for the webs. So definitely represents an increase in complexity. But it does have some advantages. It's uh, thought tends to be more accurate than grillage modeling. Uh, our flange lateral bending stresses are directly calculated. They're just the transverse bending moments from the beam elements we use to model the top and bottom flanges. And by virtue of modeling the top and bottom flanges separately, Stress concentrations in individual flanges can be reported and seen. These tend to occur, will, will sometimes occur near piers, and particularly near piers of the uh, outer girders and skewed bridges. So there, that's a useful tool to be able to see those directly from the analysis. Does have some disadvantages, though. As I mentioned, modeling is quite a bit more complex, and that's because we're using a lot more elements than we'd use for a grillage analysis. There, are, there can be significantly longer run times for live loads uh, versus grillage models. And then the uh, stress results we get from the webs can be a little more difficult to use. It's not quite as straightforward working with uh, stresses from shell elements as it is just for uh, beam element shears that are reported for the entire web. Now, the, the greatest level of complexity is what I'd call a detailed refined analysis model. This is where uh, the flanges are also modeled with a mesh of shell elements rather than using beam elements for the flanges. But as before, girder webs are modeled with a me mesh of shell em elements shown in orange here, and the cross frames are still modeled with green elements, with, with beam elements, which are shown in green in this figure. Now this, uh, uh, this, is, this would represent the, uh, the most complex method out there for modeling a uh, steel curve girder system. It does have some advantages. It's considered the most accurate method. And it, and say you're doing a, a research project to calibrate code equations, that sort of thing, or large-scale parametric study, th this type of detailed refined analysis might be required for something like that. However, for, uh, for practical load rating projects, I, I probably really wouldn't recommend it. It does have some significant disadvantages. Uh, the modeling is, is very complex because now I mean, we're also introducing shell elements into the top and bottom flanges of, the, of our, our beam elements. Uh, the, the flange and web stress results, uh, there are a lot of them because there are a lot of shell elements. These results can be a little uh, difficult to use and correlate with code equations. And probably the largest disadvantage is it has the longest run time for live loads of any method. Take a long time to run one of these models for live load, particularly for multi-span continuous bridge. But, so these are the four, um, four general ways to, to model uh, steel curve girder systems. But 
Let's take a look of uh, one example bridge to see how using these different these four different types of modeling methods compares in terms of accuracy of the force results obtained and just how the force results from different analysis methods compare to one another. Uh, it's not often that we get the chance to compare our models to actual field data, so when we do, it, it, to me at least, it's pretty interesting to see how different modeling methods stack up against one another. Uh, so the, the bridge in question is uh, Bridge 207, which was instrumented during construction in Pennsylvania. It has a uh, eight, approximately a 1,900-foot radius. Uh, deflections as a result of placing the deck conch and stays in place forms were measured and compared to predictions. Uh, this research was performed by Dr. Deanna Neveling, Dr. Daniel Lenzel, and Z Jason Shura while they, uh, at Penn State University. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Neveling, and she's now with Baker, uh, one of our one of our top engineers. She's probably the the lead engineer, not me. But uh, th thanks to her for sharing this data. And uh, this data was also compared to two minus models that were built just for this seminar. So here's some screenshots of uh, bridge 207. It's a two span. You can see here it's a two span bridge. Uh, you can see the stay in place forms. There are uh, there are five girder lines of this bridge. Uh, here's a uh, framing plan, just a, a plan and elevation. See the uh, it's span two is longer than span one by about 50 feet. And there's several, uh, you can see in the elevation view below, that there's several uh, flange plate size transitions along the length of the girder. So here are uh, girder one deflections due to placing the deck stay in place forms, haunch, uh that were measured in the field for girder one. And here we can see uh, the deflections that were uh, computed for this bridge by both doing making a basic grillage model using SAP 2000 software that's shown with the thinner black line with the diamonds, and by doing a detailed refined analysis using Abacus 3D software, where this again detailed refined analysis where both the beam flanges and webs were modeled using a mesh a fine mesh in this case shell elements. And well, as we'd probably expect, we can see that the detailed refined analysis, it's, it's pretty close to these computed deflections, so it seems pretty accurate. We could say just by comparing these deflections, well, the basic grillage model, not so much. It, it's, it's a ways off, that's for sure. But let's look then at how uh, the results compare to a detailed grillage model and a basic refined analysis where uh, beam elements are used for the flanges instead of uh, instead of a mesh of shell elements. Well, working backwards, we can see that the, uh, that the uh, refined analysis, it, it's pretty close to the detailed refined analysis. And the, the detailed grillage, it's not too far behind, a little less accurate. But all, all in all, still pretty close. Uh, looking at our girder 3 deflections, we can see that a basic grillage model is still quite a bit, uh, bit ways off from what was measured in the field. Again, that's the red line. While our detailed refined analysis, our refined analysis, and their detailed grillage model here are all coming in really close together and pretty close to the field data. And looking at the girder five deflections, uh, this is a this is a result I wouldn't uh, ordinarily expect. But in the longer span, the uh, the detailed grillage and refined analysis are coming a little closer actually to the field data than the detailed refined analysis. I don't. Wouldn't expect that to be the case most of the time, though. But we can still see here that our basic grillage model is is not so accurate. So, uh, let, so th that's how deflections stack up. Let's see how uh, forces compare, or forces or stresses compare between using a uh, detailed grillage and a refined analysis. Well, for our maximum girder top flange unfactored tensile stress due to these dead loadings. Refined analysis and detailed grillage, uh, they're really close. Same with maximum girder one top flange compression. They're off just by a hundredth of a decimal point, detailed grillage versus refined analysis. That's a pretty remarkable result. But there's a, so there, th those forces are really close for, uh, stresses, pardon me, are really close for the uh, girder one top flange. But when it comes to maximum tension and compression in the cross frames, there there's some noticeable differences between the detailed grillage and refined analysis. The the cross frame forces for the detailed grillage model uh, they're quite a bit larger than the refined analysis forces, so significantly larger here as we can see. 
Uh, let's look at the uh, top flange lateral bending stress uh, at the point for maximum positive in plane moment for uh, and at the point of max maximum negative moment for girder one. You can see that the overall magnitude of these uh, flange lateral bending stresses that are computed for detailed grillage and refine analysis, the overall magnitudes are not that far off, but percentage wise, the detailed grillage flange lateral bending stresses are over twice as large as those computed using refined analysis. So I think we can conclude from this that I wouldn't, ex we might not expect, I mean this is just one bridge of course, but if we just draw some broad conclusions, I think we can conclude that just from looking at this that we might not expect a basic grillage model of a curved girder structure, even one with a pretty large radius to be that accurate. But we can also conclude that it seems a detailed refined analysis isn't significantly more accurate than refined analysis. So probably no reason for a load rating to go ahead and model the flanges of a girder with shell elements. Uh, we've seen that the detailed grillage and refined analysis deflections are similar with, and the major axis bending stresses are similar, which is just that if it's girder forces that you're after primarily, a detailed grillage model, at least for a, bridges of a relatively large radius like this one might be okay. However, we did see that the cross frame and lateral flange lateral bending stresses were quite a bit larger in the detailed grillage model versus the refined analysis. Now at Baker, we've seen uh, cross frame forces, the cross frames themselves controlling the ratings of a number of curved girder structures. And I mean, since cross frames are primary members in these structures, we can't ignore them. And so knowing that the cross frame forces in, I mean, detailed, this detailed grillage modeling, grillage modeling tend to be higher than in refined analysis, might be worth it to, if you suspect uh, cross frame forces could end up controlling the rating, to go ahead and undertake a refined analysis, even if the radius of curvature is pretty large. I'd also recommend refined analysis for skewed bridges. That's actually where we've seen the most uh, probably the most unexpected results compared to what you'd get from a line beam analysis. But I think it's just worthwhile stepping back and see just what you get from using these uh, four different analysis methods. And again, whichever software you're using, whichever software package you choose to use, it's worth it to look into it and see just what type of analysis, what type of modeling method your software analysis package is using. Now, if you're using more general programs, such as Midas Civil, where you'll construct your model yourself, you know, think about how large your radius of curvature is, how uh, likely your cross frames are to control, and then decide, I think, whether you would, whether it makes sense to use refined analysis or not. Personally, we've been just starting with refined analysis. Seems to work pretty well, and then might actually save some time versus having to change a grillage model into a refined model if it turns out our cross frames do not rate. Some other modeling considerations too is for any steel structure, we need to you know, calculate stress by applying loads correctly to you know, loads applied to the non-composite section versus loads applied to the end composite versus loads applied to the three end composite section. We need to keep all that straight and to sum our girder plan stresses together appropriately using the non-composite, end composite, and three end composite section properties. Also, we need to be very sure to define boundary conditions with care. I think this is the only uh, exclamation point. Well, I think there's one more that you'll see in this presentation, but that's because defining boundary conditions, particularly for curved girder models, is super important. And also, just should note, if you have multiple fixed piers in a curved girder system, be sure to define the longitudinal stiffness of those piers with a spring stiffness rather than a, sing a fixed point in the model, or else you'll get pretty, uh, uh, pretty goofy force results, particularly at the uh, bottom flanges near those supports. So. Uh, one, one tip that you can use if you're using MIDAS is uh, to make sure that the node local axis of the nodes at your uh, support locations is aligned with the girders. This facilitates defining the boundary conditions of the supports correctly. Here's the second exclamation point, and that you should restrain rotational degrees of freedom with caution. Now, typically, in a, a 2D model, we'll often restrain out-of-plane uh, out bending just to keep the model stable, but in 3D, those, uh, all the rotational degrees of freedom should be unrestrained unless you're very sure that the bearing does offer um, rotational restraint about the degree of freedom under consideration. Because if they, they don't offer a rotational restraint and you do constrain the rotational degrees of freedom, 
Often what we'll see, you'll see as a result is a fictitious negative moment that will appear above the end supports. That, if you start looking at the uh, boundary conditions in detail, and then unrestrain the uh, supports in the model, will determine that negative, it will uh, turn out that that negative moment really isn't there. So be, be very careful with those uh, boundary conditions. So that, that brings us to the end of step one, modeling uh, for seal curve girders. You can see it's a pretty, de it's a, a pretty detailed uh, subject and you know, really, really does have a lot, of, uh, a lot of influence on the types of uh, load rating results you'll get for seal curve girders, particularly for elements such as the cross frames. And there's some uh, things to keep in mind for going on to step two, computing demand capacity ratios. The, uh, uh, for steel curve girders, we are using our LRFD uh, non-compact flexural resistance. These equations are in terms of stress. So from a grillage model, you can just uh, find, find those stresses from just summing up doing MC over I for non-composite, N-composite, and three uncomposite sections. Well, for refined analysis, uh, since you'll be uh, using uh, individual beam elements to model the flanges, that uh, longitudinal in-plane bending stress in a flange is just the axial force from that flange beam element divided by its area. So just have to think about how to extract those forces depending on those, extract those stresses for our LRFD non-compact flexural resistance checks just based on what type of model you're, make, uh, you're making. Now, there are, there are different ways of approximating the flange lateral bending stress. Uh, one method that's in the literature is shown here that uh, from a grillage model, you can approximate it as a function of the, the torsion from the beam section, and that's just a pure torsion. Uh, the L is the distance between cross frames, H is the total height of the girder, and T sub F and B sub F, those are the flange thickness and width, respectively. But for refined analysis, we don't need to approximate anything. It's one of the advantages. And the flange lateral bending stress is just for each type of non-composite, n-composite, three n-composite section. It's just uh, mz over c over i, where here we're getting our uh, flange lateral bending stress is simply the out-of-plane bending moment in our flange elements, that beam elements that are used to model the girder. Now. Uh, uh, LRFD shear resistance, that's in terms of force. So if we're working with a refined analysis or detailed refined analysis model, uh, we can defy, divide our shear resistance computed by LRFD to the web area to convert the uh, shear resistance to a stress, which then we can compare to our maximum shearing stress in those uh, shell elements that we're using for the webs to then do our code check there. Uh, here's just a screenshot of the, the code check spreadsheet we use to determine demand capacity ratios it's based on the prior equations and LRFD section 6. Then uh, from this point on, it's pretty much the same uh, procedure as uh, before. It's just still select points of interest using demand capacity ratios from a code check spreadsheet, typically for curved girders, regions of maximum positive and negative moment often controls, one might expect, and at uh, plate size transitions control for flanges, and often, as I've mentioned, we've seen that cross frames will often control the rating. Then comes the next step, step four, extracting influence lines is perform to perform the general procedure. Here, uh, for steel curve girders, uh, depending on the type of software you're using, you can have a choice. You can either extract an, an influence surface for the bridge width as a whole, or you can extract a series of influence lines defined for the individual center lines at the lanes on the, uh, on the curved girder bridge. Personally, I, I prefer the latter method, extracting a series of influence lines, because in terms of applying this general procedure, it's a little easier to work with an influence surface. But either, either, way, either way works. And this can, this can be done if you're in, your, in Midas, and I'm sure other software packages as well. Then when we get to applying the LRFR rating equation, uh, we have all the information we need, just, just as before. Our capacity will have been calculated at each point of interest. Um, first from our code check spreadsheet for a, a steel flange, this would be a capacity based on stress uh, with uh, the appropriate system and condition factors from LRFR and the LRFD fee factor. Uh, our, permanent lo our permanent loads will have been computed, our permanent forces will have been computed using uh, the, our force results from our 3D finite element model, whether it's a grillage or, or, or a uh, refined analysis, and that, that stress would be just uh, using the one-third rule in LRFD, our longitudinal stress plus a third of the lateral bending stress, multiplied by the appropriate LRFR uh, uh, load factors found in uh, manual for bridge evaluation, 
And then our live load will be determined by you the influence lines at each point of interest. And that can be in terms of uh, stress as well. So you can get stress for uh, influence line. And then we'll need to have extracted influence lines for both the uh, longitudinal bending stress and uh, lateral bending stress. And those influence lines will usually be quite a bit different from one another. And uh, once we've done that, then we can go ahead and compute our rating factors. One, um, I don't need to read this slide to you, but one thing to be aware of is that in the 2013 Manual for Bridge Evaluation Interims, there's been some new language added about uh, additional provisions if you are using refined analysis, which in terms of the Manual for Bridge Evaluation is uh, all any type of 3D analysis. So there are some provisions here to be sure to increase routine permit factors by 0.1 and to place two routine permit vehicles in adjacent lanes. For special uh, permits mixed with traffic, they are, there are these uh, specific live load factors which are specified for uh, these types of permit load ratings for 3D analysis. And then lastly at the bottom, there's a 1.1 uh, live load factor that's specified for escorted special permits with no other vehicles. These provisions are in here because uh, using a 3D analysis takes away a little bit of the conserves from some of the conservatism found in the 2D LRFD distribution factor. So these provisions are in here to then direct people how to how to use uh, these 3D models correctly for permit load ratings. So just be just be aware they're there. They're introduced in the 2013 interims. So that that brings us to uh, the end of this talk. Uh, could go on quite a bit longer talking about how to apply this procedure for other bridge types, but we don't have time. But I think there's some general conclusions we can draw from this. I'd say to advise to use the, the simplest model possible for your bridge type, but not too simple for the required task. For a straight concrete rigid frame, like what we started out with, a 2D strip analysis method should be, should be sufficient. But for a 3D curved girder, if you're rating a 3D curved girder where the cross frames may control the rating, it may be that going through that extra effort to make a refined analysis uh, model is, is really what is required to deliver a reasonable result to the, the client that reflects reality. Uh, we've also touched a little bit on uh, just how to use interaction diagrams and strut and tie analysis and load rating. They're, they're useful tools for reinforced concrete and post-tension concrete. As far as a strut and tie analysis goes, we found for uh, we've been finding that for uh, reinforced concrete and post-tension uh, concrete box girders that uh, we've been rating that have multiple units with uh, so-called shiplap joints, where one one unit extends upward and sort of rests on a corbel from the bottom unit. Often, the reinforcing in that uh, in that joint will control the entire rating, and assessing the strength of that reinforcement is something that can be easily done using strut and tie analysis. So. It's a useful tool, and as I've been saying, I would consider using refined analysis for steel curve girders because there are definite advantages that is there in terms of calculating uh, cross frame forces, and you know that overall you're likely using a more accurate method of analysis. I'd encourage people if you're uh, curious about have more curiosity about different methods of uh, modeling steel curve girder bridges, so the NCHRP report 725 is out there. It talks about this subject in great detail, so I encourage you to look that up. So uh, that, that brings me to the end of the, the talk. I, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Hope you found this to be useful and be happy to take any questions. Now on my uh, computer screen here, if there's a question pane on the side, I can't see it. So, uh, so Grace, if, if, you could, uh, if you could ask me need a question, then I can respond to it if, any, if anyone has questions out there. Okay, sure, Dan. Um, I will take a question. Uh, one is from Philip Saucer. He's asked, how are warping torsion stresses captured in the refined analysis models of the curved steel girder bridge? Oh, for, for refined analysis, they are captured in the out-of-plane bending stress, uh, out-of-plane bending moment of the uh, elements used to model each the, of the beam elements used to model each flange. So if we were, if we were just looking at a cross section of a uh, of a of a, gir of a steel girder in a refined analysis, we would uh, for the top flange we'd model that with a line of beam elements. Then we would have modeled the web with a uh, mesh of shell elements, and then we'd model the bottom flange with a line an, a separate line of beam elements. And if we looked at the force results of those beam elements, we'd have uh, 
large axial forces that, that would correspond to in-plane bending moment, and then we'd have just out of, we'd, we'd have uh, transverse bending moments, uh, MZ moments in the, the Midas sign convention, and those MZ moments, those correspond to the uh, flange lateral bending stresses due to warping torsion. And another thing I should mention is that by virtue of modeling the top and bottom flanges separately, and then the web with shell, webs with shell elements, this enables the cross section to warp and distort, because uh, that, that web can undergo double curvature bending, which is something that for most, the beam elements in most programs, if you're modeling the each uh, girder line with a single line of beam elements, they don't have that warping uh, stiffness to be able to do that. Okay, and one last question uh, before we end this. Um, since the superstructure is integral to the pier cap, is it appropriate to model the cap with strut and tie model, which is a truss modeling method, as members aren't acting as truss members? Oh, well, I mean, strut and tie analysis, it's, it's often used for just large monolithic concrete sections like uh, pier caps of... Uh, pier caps of hammerhead piers or uh, inverted T-beam sections. So, uh, I mean, it, it definitely should be appropriate here. It's just idealizing the flow of forces through just a large reinforced concrete section as a, a flow of forces as a truss. It doesn't, it doesn't assume that it's, it's really exactly behaving as a truss. But what we can do is the, uh, for the, the elements of this idealized truss in a strut and time model that are in compression, we can compare that just using the Ashto code equations to uh, to the the strength of the concrete as a compressive strut in this region for the uh, portions of the truss in our idealized uh, truss model and the strut and tie model that are in tension. We can compare uh, those tensile forces to uh, the the uh, longitudinal or vertical steel that's present in those locations to see if there's a you know sufficient strength in our uh, rebar and this ASFY to be able to be able to take those forces. Okay. And uh, there's a there's a real nice publication out there, uh, just uh, guidelines for I don't have the exact title, but Ashto uh, LRFD strut and tie analysis. It's a it's a brown cover, I believe. It's put out by the uh, Port, uh, Portland the PCA. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend looking that up. It is a, it's a real nice reference. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Baxter, <laughs> for helping us out here with this presentation. Um, we do have a lot more questions coming in, but uh, for time's sake, we are running out of time. So what we will do is um, Dan and I will work together to give you guys these answers in written form because we have your email addresses and the registration. So we will work to do that. And um, if there are any other questions, please uh, forward it to us by email. And I'm actually in the questions box. I'm putting down... Um, our email address and as well as the number which you guys can call for more questions if you need them right away. Um, yeah, I apologize for not putting my email address and <laughs> phone number on the slide here. I meant, I meant to do that. But it sounds like the Grace has all, all that. Yes, numbers. I will forward um, the questions over to you, Dan. Okay, thanks anything. a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. Um, also, uh, last but not least, we, before we close, if anybody would also like to uh, evaluate Mida Civil in the way um, that was presented today, please let me know with the um, information I put in the questions box, my contact information. Um, please contact me there, and I will be able to help you out with that. Um, but by all means, thank you so much, Dan, for helping us out and presenting uh, such a thorough presentation. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me, Grace. Okay, great. So everyone, have a nice day, and please uh, give us a call if you need any more help. Thanks a lot.